then we have Narayanmurthy, who has taken Infosys from nothing to 165,000 employees, $10 billion in turnover, one of the leading information services firms in the world, and put India on the map. So that's the scale. So we have an outstanding social entrepreneur who has taken something and scaled it beyond anybody's dreams. And we have an outstanding commercial entrepreneur. And in fact, Mr. Naren would be able to say, no, I'm a social entrepreneur too. I've created 165,000 jobs, got skills, got the whole software industry and the ecosystem, which is a hand, hand in play. So definitely a commercial entrepreneur who's also got terrific social value for society. We have two terrific individuals here who can really talk about scaling in a real sense. And then I have my friend Jeffrey Barak. Jeff Barak was also a founder. He founded the Bridgespan Consulting Firm in the US. And they do a lot of work. They've seen a lot of nonprofits. We call them nonprofits in the US. We call them NGOs in India. He's seen a lot of nonprofits go to scale. And Jeff himself, through his consulting practice, has taken a few nonprofits to, to scale himself, like the Harlem Children's Zones, but some of you from the US might know, they have gone to scale through the personal consulting work of Jeff Brannan. So my job is very simple. I was just going to ask Madhu Pandit and Narayan Murthy to talk about how they scale. So the question I was going to ask them was, instead of going through every step of the scaling longitudinally, can you just talk about the inflection points when you've gone from zero to 1.4 billion? There must have been a handful of inflection points if you could address that, take about five to seven minutes, and the same thing for you, Narayan Murthy. And then, Jeff, you put it together. I'll sit down here with my foot up and enjoy the conversation. <laughs> Akshay Patra program started in the year 2000. And uh, when we started, we really didn't expect it to reach this scale for the simple reason that First of all, we were not really aware of this social problem of hunger among school students. The scale of the problem was not known to us. We started in a small way and word spread around and within a week, we came to know that you know more than a lack of children, the schools made application requesting feeding more than lack of the children. We were shocked. Within a radius about 15, 20 kilometers of where we were as a temple, it was shocking to discover that more than lack of children were wanting food in the afternoon. So that propelled us to think about scaling. So that's how, that was the inspiration for scaling the real awareness of the need in the society. And these children were sitting learning in the school or not learning with empty stomach. So all the funds that the government was spending was going waste in this government schools. Coming to the specific reference that uh, Mr. Dr. Kasturi had mentioned, the, uh, <clears throat> starting from the decision of what menu should be given, there was a lot of learning. First, we started with kichdi, which is, you know, basically every child needs carbohydrate, protein, minerals. And we thought to scale it, one dish which contains all this would do the job. So we started with kichdi. Basically, it's not anything new. It's very familiar in North India rice, dal, and you know, some vegetables, some mixed. So we started that for one week, it was great. But soon we realized that half of it was coming back. So I was shocked. They're hungry children, how they can not eat this? Then we learned something very important. Even if they are hungry, the children, if they don't like the taste, they don't eat. <laughs> so that was the first learning. And we changed the menu. We made rice and sambar, which is a local taste. And then nothing came back and children were very happy. 
same challenge we had in, in, in North India when we went. Since our machines were all designed for rice and sambar, we tried to replicate it there. <laughs> and then after a week, the children didn't want to take rice and dal. They wanted chapatis. So that was a challenge. Doesn't matter. We have to meet it because making rolling chapatis is so laborious. So we started with 10,000 children in Jaipur and we had 100 women brought from villages, every day transported to our kitchen and they were rolling chapatis, two chapatis a child, 20,000 chapatis per day and 10 men were standing with 10 kadais and grilling it and their hands were all burning. We gave them gloves. Finally, you know, it was not feasible. How would we, if you wanted to go to one lakh, how would you make so many chapatis? Then we researched and then we found that there is a puppet making machine which makes 3000 puppets an hour. We thought that's interesting. So we went, we gave to, we gave a project to a Sardarji in, in Ludhiana <laughs> to create a machine that would cook 10,000 chapatis. He took it as a challenge. We gave to someone in Delhi, someone in Rajasthan. The Delhi Rajasthan failed. Ludhiana Sardarji produced a wonderful machine. <laughs> he took 10,000 chapatis for us. And finally he improved it. And he has today made a machine which makes 40,000 chapatis per hour. Oh. So, the most important point that has helped us in scaling is technology. If not for the technology, this kind of scaling is impossible. And it's not the standard technology that's available in the market, a technology that was innovated for the specific social cause. Otherwise, there is no need in this country for any 40,000 chapatis per hour. So this is one point. And then, <clears throat> I don't, on, as far as the kitchen was concerned, everything, step by step, we learned. In other words, one of the important points I wanted to make, which is relevant to many of you, is when you address a cause, let not wait for, you know, making everything paka and then start. That's not the story of Akshay Pan. We started where we were, we went on improvising. Whatever was required, every moment we were doing. We started with our kitchens first, all on the ground floor. Then we found the drudgery of carrying huge quantity of rice and pouring it into the cauldrons. And the workers were getting backache. Everything has to be done in three hours time for one lakh, two lakh children to be cooked. And uh, it was, uh, you know, we had to think of solutions. We came up with the three tier kitchen, kitchen where the rice would through bucket elevators, it would go up and then it would come step by step down by gravity flow. And a lot of things we learned like this and today our kitchens are all three floors. And again we learned that we made three big slabs and then three levels. There was a big problem of communication between each floor because cooking is a continuous process. They had to communicate. Now later stage we have changed into one single floor with three steel floors where everything, communication happens very well. In the case of, you know, the item that was being cooked, in Bangalore temple where the kitchen, first kitchen is there, early morning you'll get nice smell of samba. <laughs> what, you know, mouth-watering smell of samba. We were thinking it was great. But actually, the real taste was being lost. It had to be closed, the cauldrons had to be closed then the, that taste of sambar would remain. The steam, initial cooking was open vessel, the steam was just escaping, all the energy was going away, all this starch water was being drained away, everything we learned step by step. And today, we have come up with a closed vessel mechanism <coughs> where no steam is lost, no starch is lost, all the sambar fumes remains there and 
it is at least five times energy efficient and we are able to do the same operation in one fourth of the space. Right now we are setting up this model kitchen in Hyderabad with funding from Infosys Foundation, a 16 crore kitchen, using the, all the learnings that we have. So this is the aspect of technology. Then it came to, to scale a program like this, you need funds. So the government funds the program, but the government fund is, covers only 70% of the cost of the meal. We need to scout around for another 30% from, from, from uh, corporates, individuals. Initially, the temple missionaries, it's a job to beg, they to beg and try to get the funds. But later on, it was Desh's contribution and inspiration. Please go ahead and set up a marketing department. Please spread the word around of this program. Employ professionals and you will see that the funds will come. That was his experience in the US. That's his way of doing things. And we adopted it. And today, our annual budget is 190 crores. But 100 crores we raised, 90 crores from the government and 100 crores is raised by professionals. <laughs> Thanks to them. So these are some of the things. Without, without funds, how do you escape? <coughs> now we have come to a point where we are very confident that if funds are there, we can scale it up to any level. But then it's not so easy. A huge logistics. We only proved what can happen in urban towns. We do not know what to do really to scale up in rural areas. In urban areas, we have got vehicles which will go and deliver the food in each school and bring back the vessels. But in the rural areas, the schools are spread around so much. If you want one 25,000 kitchen, you'll have to go around 60 kilometers radius. And the roads are so bad. So still now we are not cracked, though we have some rural models in Baran district in Rajasthan, the poorest district. We have set up a decentralized kitchen in, uh, in uh, Orissa also. We are still in the experimental stage. We have got a long way to go in order to really prove the concept. Even though, you know, it was told that we have scaled up, but in our mind, we think that the present scale is still experimental. Considering that 10 crore children are in need of this and we have only touched 1.5 million, no doubt the government program is there for them. Yet our, our program is something which really gives quality food, which is different from the government food that we give. So as much as possible, we want to not only do it ourselves, we want to encourage other NGOs also to, uh, to take up this kind of uh, activity. Because this is something which is very fundamental to ch education. Without food, what would we be, you know, the, what would the child learn? So with these few things, I'd like to close. So, so what I've learned at least from what uh, Madhu Pandittas has told us is, a lot of the times when we think of scaling, we tell ourselves, refine the model, make sure the model works, understand all the parameters, and once you know the model works, then you can scale, then you can replicate, then you can take pay. And he told us exactly the opposite, more or less, in the sense that Akshay Patra was born to scale because he said there were lakhs of children in and around the, the temple where they had to feed. It was born to scale, but a lot of improvisation. Understanding how to do the kitchen, introducing technology, introducing a three-flow kitchen, uh, having a marketing development department to raise funds. A lot of it is improvisation and even now he's being very modest even after feeding 1.4 million children they want to go to 5 million children by 2020 and he said I don't know how to operate a rural model we know how to operate in urban cities I don't know how to operate a rural model so it looks like a lot of scaling is improvising learning by doing but being alert but keeping the ambition and passion at heart that's what I learned from okay Dr. Narayan Muti your look thank you well, in our story was slightly different. Chris is here, one of the architects of all that scaling up that we did. 
Between 1981 and 1991, we didn't do any scaling because we are operating in perhaps the most business unfriendly environment in the world. <laughs> Everything was a problem. So therefore our growth also went from perhaps $40,000 of revenue in 1981-82 to about one more half million dollars in 1991. So we were just coping with it. Scaling up becomes necessary when, as other uh, uh, does point, there is need for growth. When we had the economic reforms in 1991, that is when Chris, Nandan, myself, and you know, six six of us, the founders, we sat down. And then we said, look, now government is, our, is not our constraint. Our constraint is our ability to differentiate in the marketplace. Therefore, we have to think of scaling up. Then again, we, we, we are generally very strategic in the company. So we wrote down several of the principles that we would use in scaling up. One we said, we cannot afford to lose quality, response time, and budget when we scale up. In other words, Today, you know, in 1991, there may have been 40 projects. We say even when we went to 4,000 projects, every project must deliver a certain minimum acceptable level of quality. There must be a minimum acceptable level of productivity, a minimum level of response time to customer needs or time to market, and we have to operate the uh, projects within budget. Second, we said, whatever technology we use, whatever models that we use, the reaction, the reaction time of the system cannot be worse than what it is doing. Else, our decision making will get slowed down. Third, we said, this was a very important uh, principle, we said, Everybody in the company must have the same view of the various parameters that define the state of our system emphasis on a need to know basis. That is, whether I am sitting in Boston or in Bangalore or in Mangalore, wherever it doesn't matter. All of us must have the same view of the accounts receivables, same view of production in uh, uh, work in progress, you know, uh, attrition rates, whatever you want. Everything, everybody, every part of the world where we operate must have the same thing. And of course, we came to the conclusion that the only way you can do it is through technology. And therefore, our the story of uh, scaling up, the story of using technology to scale up started when we were hardly two million dollars. But that was a that was a plan. We didn't say that we will scale in every area of of our operations in the same year. For example. In the in you know we built our first campus in you know, first building of our campus in 1994. That was a place where thousand people could sit. We pretty quickly realized, and we also looked at a study by University of Pennsylvania, their psychology department, that said an ideal workplace is one where 
there are not more than 250 people. Then you almost know everybody by face. Kind of thing. So we said, from now onwards, when we build any new infrastructure, we'll ensure that there is a cohesive group of 250 people in it. Second, when uh, we got listed in India in 1993, we said, look, we have to get listed on NASDAQ. And for us to do that, we have to get to quarterly uh, results. At, at that point of time in India, nobody had done any quarterly results. We are the first ones who did it voluntarily. Second, we said, we have to learn to uh, look at all the, the balance sheet and the income statement according to US GAAP. And later on, we, in fact, we went to, we became the first company in the world to uh, provide the financial statements according to the generally accepted accounting principles of eight countries. <coughs> You know, India, US, uh, you know, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Japan, Australia, etc. Then we said, look, we have to bring in technology into our uh, system of recruitment because we found that the recruitment rate was increasing. Therefore, we said, we need to prepare our learnability tests, which are basically quizzes, you know, so that we can randomly pick these quizzes, of course, based on a certain degree of difficulty going from one to whatever nth possible. And that has to be different for different uh, uh, places because those days we used to go to IITs. You gave one, uh, you know, in one IIT you gave a set of questions. And by telephone, that will be transferred to the next IIT because next day we would be going to that. So these are pretty smart fellows. <laughs> so we said, we have to randomize and we have to give different kinds of stuff. Then uh, we realized that, look, training these people is not very easy if we did it at different places because we wanted a certain common standard for all the people. So that's how we established our uh, Infosys University. Then it was in 1994, uh, 93 I remember, Chris just came back from the US where he was there for about 10 years. And he said, look, if we have to continue to deliver our project with quality productivity on time, then you need a project management workbench, which will tell you on your desktop the status of the project. And this has to be obviously a real-time system, you know, uh, based on whatever technology you use. So the, the thing is this, while we built up systems, methodologies, processes, all of this, we did them as and when we realized that X years from then, we would not be able to operate manually. And therefore, because as you know better than I do, it takes a few years to build these information systems, we took those decisions in well in time. And that's how we did it. We didn't scale up everything at the same time. We didn't do that. Sorry. I I think th this is an interesting story because from what I've heard you say, Dr. Narayamurthy, is that you didn't start, you were not born to scale. Like Akshay Patra was born to scale because there's so many kids to feed. Whereas you had smaller ambitions till 1991, but then the opportunity for growth showed up after 91. And when the opportunity for growth showed up, a lot of the things you've described in great detail is creating the platform for growth, quality standards, training standards, dashboard for following a project. It's almost like creating a platform for growth. It's like a sling. It's like something you can jump off from. It gives you the real dynamic push off from that platform to growth. And then you grew tremendously. That's how you took it to scale. And Jeffrey, you take us from there. Thank you, Cash. First, let me just say it's it's great to be here, and it's a privilege to to say a few words about two organizations 
that are so unrepresentative of their peers. I mean, they are so distinguished by the scale they've achieved in the for-profit sector and in the non in the nonprofit sector that they really stand alone. And they're both written about a lot. And so I think there's a lot to learn from them. I want to highlight a few of those things, but I also want to highlight a few things that maybe um, is worth us exploring a bit that may not be best reflected by these two exemplar um, organizations. The thing that I'm most struck by in what, what's in common is an extraordinary discipline of thought and action in doing their work. Um, and so while it's the word experimentation and innovation and adaptation can sound loose and uh, kind of unguided, both of these stories have a tremendous amount of discipline about what they were looking at kind of in sequence and thinking very hard about kind of laying the groundwork for further scale. And so I think one of the common things is this issue of, of discipline. Now, one of the things that, that strikes me that also comes out of both stories is the crucial role of people. I mean, it's interesting to hear in the case of Emphasis that one of the first kind of in, information uh, platforms that was created was around recruiting. And the example in Oxapatra of Desh saying, you know, one of the things you need to do is hire people in marketing and so forth is one of these beneath the surface ingredients to scale um, that is often unremarked, but is absolutely crucial, which is the ability to attract the, the people that can help get you from that early stage to this stage of building systems, building processes that enable you to create this slingshot effect um, to growth. And what's uncommon for most NGOs, I would say, is that it, uh, often the funding system does not support that kind of investment as much as it should if we care deeply about scale. Similarly, on IT investments, the, 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 the role of technology in the growth of Akshapatra is clearly core to scale um, and is a wonderful calling card for all philanthropists and all investors to say, if we want to see NGO scale, we want to see these kinds of organizations scale, we need to make these kinds of investments. Um, but often they're rare, and so it's a little bit of a plug. Uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, my organization writes a lot about what we call the starvation cycle, which is that too often we starve organizations, expect them to scale without being able to make these kinds of investments in what it takes to actually deliver results. Um, the final point would just be around the impact, um, and this question, and, and it's kind of taken for granted here, but the discipline of thinking about did you know, were you able to deliver meals that actually were nutritionally valuable and, and powerful for children? We kind of skip over the part that so many of us grapple with, which is at the early stages, do you really have something that makes a difference? Do you really have a demonstrated impact that is worth building upon? Not that it's the once and for all, we prove it, and then we just stamp it out into the universe. Um, but there is an upfront part about the discipline, use of data and analysis to make sure that there's a there there from which you can build. So one way I can think about it, and then I'll, I'll stop, is that there's this front end stage of experimentation, innovation, proof of concept. There's a lot of different words for it. There's this next stage of scaling, but it's a kind of scaling version one, getting you to a certain point, maybe to the 1.4 uh, million children. And then there's what might be called transformative scale. What does it take to truly go from serving a problem to perhaps solving the problem? at a tremendous scale. And that often requires a very different set of strategies. And so even here, we started to hear about different uses of technology, the ability to attract it to help what might be viewed as competitors actually do your business model so you can reach the 100 million children that might benefit from those meals. That's a very different set of strategy questions of how do you, the difference between actually delivering something to saying how do we train a whole nother set of organizations across India, let's say, to do this kind of work. And so one of the final differences between the for-profit sector and the non-profit sector that we sometimes bump up against is that it's not enough to solve the problem in most cases in the, in the social sector with an organization growing. It's usually a whole cluster of organizations, a whole field of organizations needing to work together in some way or in parallel but in, in a cohesive way to solve the problem. So it'll be interesting to see, just like Infosys developed Infosys University, whether there'll be an Akshapatra University that trains similarly people that might be able to do this kind of work around <laughs> India, around the world, and that that's a strategy for transformative scale that really looks different than what get, gets you to this first stage. So, so, so uh, Jeff, let me follow up on the last point you made. And this is a question both for Akshapatra and Infosys. 
Following up on that, Infosys, in order to scale, had to put the training systems in place, the Infosys University. And you're suggesting that Akshay Patra might also have to have a university like that. Might have. But this raises the question of when you scale, the question for you two gentlemen is, do you have to scale linearly in the sense, in order for Akshay Patra to reach five million children, do you have to create more kitchens, more food, more trucks, more kids? Or do you scale non-linearly? You start a knowledge bank like an Akshapatra University and other people come and learn from that and they scale. Simply for Infosys, you scale in one way, but the other way to scale might be creating the ecosystem where there are copycat Infosys. I won't say copycat Infosys. A lot of the other companies here are going to get very upset, but there are other knowledge companies, information systems companies, the whole ecosystem develops and the whole thing takes off. Does it have to be linear scaling? Can it be non-linear, which ultimately leads to the same effect, especially in social enterprise, we need impact. It doesn't matter who does it, five million children have to be fed. So, your response. Yeah, in now case, since it's a cause that there's no competition, in that sense, um, sharing this knowledge and uh, training other organizations Inspiring people to float organizations, retired people, who, you know, they have nothing to do. Say, okay, float an organization. Here we will pass on the technology, we pass on the logistics, everything that we learn, we pass on to you. It's very much thought of by Akshay Patra, a training module, uh, which would help to reach the big scale. So are you doing it deliberately or are you just letting it happen by chance? That's the question. If you think non-linear scaling is the way to, to get to the end point, can you actually engineer it? Now, as of now, we are not deliberately doing that. Okay. But we know that we have to really touch all the 10 crore children, then we need to deliberately go ahead with this. But before that, as I was explaining, that the rural model, all these things, we have to again go through a learning curve. And so that, you know, they don't do the same mistake that we have done. As Jeff said, you know, being a non-profit sector, especially we could afford to make a lot of mistakes. And... Uh, so what are the big mistakes you made in terms you know, of scaling? If somebody is a perfectionist, you would say, hey, you should have thought of earlier, why did you make one floor kitchen? You should have, first, it's a, such a common sense thing. You know, people can't carry huge, uh, you know, large scale cooking, you need to have thought of earlier, it's a grand flow. Like that, if somebody wants to find fault with every previous model, they can find fault that you could have thought of it earlier. So we want to complete that process, come to a certain level of, you know, having covered most of these things, and then pass on that model to others. Okay, you still think model needs to be refined. Narayanmurti, your response to that? No, let me give you some data to share to point out whether it's linear or non-linear. It took us 23 years to get to the first billion dollars. It took 23 months to get to the next billion dollars. It took 13 months to get to the third billion dollars. And I think by 2000, Whatever, seven or something, we are already there at six billion. Then, of course, it's good. So, therefore, I think when the market opportunity exists, whether you like it or not, everybody in the company wants not to be sure. The adrenaline is flowing, there is excitement in the air, there is confidence in the air. Therefore, people will try and reach for the stuff. And a good leader is one who will facilitate such reaching for the stuff. So therefore, I don't think it's an option. Second, whether we deliberately create a other company, uh, work towards disseminating our in our innovations working, we did. Because I have this belief that the only way you can create 
sustained enthusiasm for new innovations and cooperation. The only way people will not rest on their laurels is if you proactively disseminate your innovation in the marketplace amongst your competitors after taking the initial advantage of your innovation. That is the only way you continue to be innovative. Otherwise, everybody will say, no, no, we innovated in 2003, now we can go to sleep. So at least as far as emphasis was concerned, we had a very clear policy that whatever innovations we brought in, we will widely disseminate how we did that. After taking, of course, we are not saints, but after taking initial so, so let me intervene here and then, then maybe Jeff, I'll pass this on to you first. So, so far we've been talking about scaling as a good thing. There are opportunities, we can grow, we can scale, there are so many children to be fed, it's a good thing. But looking at a lot of the social entrepreneurs in this room, a lot of social entrepreneurship is from the heart. As we were told, you have to do it from the heart. It's individual passion that leads to social entrepreneurship. Is there a limit to scale? Is there anything wrong, Jeff? Why don't you take a first crack at this question? For a social entrepreneur to do something within their community or whatever they want to do for their set of 10,000, 20,000 farmers or for their set of schools in the district, do it very well, get a lot of satisfaction, that's their passion and be very happy about it and go to sleep happily. Why do you have to solve the world's problem? If you can solve your neighborhood's problem, that's a very good thing too. Yes, I would. I, if everybody solved their neighborhood problem, we wouldn't have problems. Um, and so that is a path to solving uh, problems. And so I don't think, you know, I'm certainly not an advocate for, you know, the answer to all things is the mass, the massification of the answers that everybody adopts. Um, I think that the sandbox is a wonderful example of, you know, a, a very local kind of set of activities that has an incredibly powerful effect. Just having been in Hubli the last couple of days, it's just extraordinary the impact it's had. It's also interesting when I looked at the brochure when I opened the packet, that there are other people now attempting to create sandboxes in other parts of India. Um, that's a form of scale of a set of ideas. It's not the rote re repetition of the exact same thing because obviously different areas are different, just like the, the children's eating habits are different in different areas. So I think it, part of it is to make sure we don't misstate what, what scaling impact is. It doesn't mean we're stamping out a uniform product in every single place. It's how do we get in a faster, more kind of easy fashion, the scaling of things, the, in, the impact of which is changing lives, whatever the outcome is that you care about, which may be you know, through any, the exact replication of a kitchen, but it could be that this kitchen obviously does not work in rural areas. So there's going to have to be, if we want to kind of work on that problem, there's going to have to be another set of innovations around that. So I think one of the big changes in the, right now in the scale discussions at globally and other different parts of the world is a recognition that a lot of solutions, the vast majority of solutions are going to be need to be deeply rooted in local communities. That is you know, where change happens, that is where the action is. But it doesn't mean that those communities don't benefit from learning from other communities, from the ability to identify best practices and so forth. I think just to, on that, to, to close on that, the, the example of the university, I just think is an interesting one, in this, in this evolution of the NGO and social sector, which is, will we have the, the resources to be able to build a platform to share the lessons of Akshapatra that would be equivalent, let's say, to the kind of resources Infosys invested in attempting to scale what it did around the world. And in obviously a very different context and so forth, but we have to be careful not to expect the NGOs to be able to deliver that kind of result on meager, meager, meager resources. It needs to be able to invest in people, invest in systems, if we really want to see scale grow in that way. Uh, I may be talking without much knowledge of uh, social entrepreneurship. Oh, you do it all the time. All social entrepreneurs <laughs> do it all the time. You're in good company. <laughs> I personally do not see too much of difference in 
how social entrepreneurship organizations and for-profit organizations work, except the following. One, generally social entrepreneurship organizations work in the area of commons, that is, Correct. where there is a common goal. Second, they operate in areas where the market is still not developed, the consumers do not have the disposable income to buy those services. Third, the objectives of any organization yeah. serves by <coughs> common good. My common good. No? Am I the problem? No. <laughs> Organizations that serve common good have more diffused objectives, unlike a for-profit organization, which has earnings per share as one simple important objective. Now, if you leave these things aside, if you say, yeah, revenues are small, you know, uh, therefore, there has to be focus on thrift, all of that. Then if you say that, the, this is serving in the area of common good, etc., etc. I personally believe that there is much greater need for focus on cost, focus on efficiencies, focus on response times, all of that in a social entrepreneurship organization uh, compared to a for-profit organization. So I don't divide these two as, I don't know, separate kind of organizations, but I say, you know, you're an expert. I mean, I'm making a fool of myself, but that's okay. <laughs> so I... We are an expert in non-profits to talk about that rather than... No, I agree with this that the principles are same, except that there is some kind of a leniency in the social sector, <laughs> unlike in the, you know, you'll be punished very hard in this in the corporate sector if you do some mistakes and if you're not, you know, because it's a competitive world. But in the social sector, there's leniency. And at the same time, somebody who has a conscience to do something common good to X number of people, the same conscience will actually give sufficient inspiration with the same cost, why not cover to X? So, the, 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 the motivation is still there and the same principles can be applied, but it is voluntary and it, that, that makes the organization to organization the difference is made. In Akshay Patra, we do stress a lot on cost. Every board meeting we ask why the cost, you know, is this much? Why not, you know, what is this, you know, what is the salary cost? Why it's going up? Why not bring it down? It's, we do ask all these questions, which I think every corporate asks. But ultimately, as I said, the difference is not as, need not be as, there's no pressure to be as rigid as the corporate business. Jeff, a quick response. What's so striking about this is that the... One of the things that's mo most striking about this is that I agree that the core principles of what it takes to build a great organization transcend sector, whether it's nonprofit, for profit, a hybrid organization. But the story that's interesting about emphasis about this the curve of growth that you described of you know twenty three years to get to one billion, twenty three months, thirteen months, I can't think of a nonprofit where the curve looks like that. In, in a weird way, it often gets harder because people say, you're doing so great, you don't need our money anymore. I, and so there's, I mean, it's a, the dynamics are challenging. And I say this not to be pessimistic about scale. I've spent the last 20, 25 years studying it and helping people with it. But it goes back this morning to, in some sense, the question, like we have to crack that question. Akshapatra is an extraordinary organization doing amazing work. It should not be so hard to scale it. Like if, in, in terms of just the capital, if it was a for-profit, capital would be flowing to it like a river, saying this is the best return on investment you can possibly have. And as nonprofits go, capital is flowing, but not at this rate that's now doubling 
you know, doubling its scale. So I, I just, I pose it as the question for all of us to figure out how to crack because it's so important, because what the work is so important, we've got to figure out how to get these kinds of impact you know, propositions out into the world more fully. Sure, but, but let me do one thing. So I'm just going to take a slightly counter point of view, okay? And dear Spiders, I'm an expert or not, uh, let me just share one with you, and I'm going to use an example from what Kailash Satyarthi used in the model. So when you're dealing with kitchen, when you're dealing with feeding kids, when you're dealing with those kinds of issues, efficiency is important, capital is short, so you have to make sure you optimize your resources. The same amount of money can reach far more children, can reach far more farmers. Bringing management principles is absolutely important, I don't deny it. But when it comes to other kinds of social enterprise issues, like human values, this morning, Kalash Satyarthi told us about saving Idris, thus Lima's child, and when he tried to scale more by saving even more Idris, he went to jail. The cop put him in jail. So here it's a question of a child's life. It's not a question of scaling and saying, can I save a million more Idris? Finally, his solution came not in going to the supply side to work with German carpet makers, to work with consumers, etc., where the scaling was achieved differently through the rug mark symbol. What I'm trying to say is some aspects of social enterprise are about human values, where it's not an efficiency, methodical management method. You use different methods to scale. You don't scale the operations, you scale advocacy, you scale different things. Like I'm sure Akshay Patra now is part of the government advocacy policy making on midday meals. So we've got to be very careful about scaling. Scaling is not always good. Sometimes small is beautiful. How we scale, I think we have to have a very nuanced view of scaling when it comes to social enterprise. That's a point I'd like to offer and see how you gentlemen react. You know, I don't know if I totally agree with you. Even in social entrepreneurship, there are two aspects. One, those organizations which are trying to change human behavior. That is what Kailash is doing. On the other hand, there are other social entrepreneurship organizations which are making it more comfortable for people, for children, whatever it is. I think while the point that you made is absolutely right in the case of Kailash's organization, but in the case of Akshay Patra, it is not the same. Their efficiencies matter. Their ability to market themselves better and better and better and garner bigger and bigger uh, donations, that is not inachievable. So therefore, to a large extent, I would say that Madhu Pandit Das organization, with Akshay Patra, would resemble a for-profit organization much more than Kailash. That, that's the point I make. Non-profit social enterprises and commercial enterprises that create a lot of social value. Infosys is an example. What about human talent? Human talent, non-profits are usually short of where can we get them? Well, Anjali, the, there is a, an unspoken of so, corporate, a rule for corporate behavior. And that is, every corporation extols the virtue of competition in public and will do everything possible <laughs> to prevent competition in private. <laughs> that is the reality. <laughs> that is a well-proven rule. <laughs> no, I can't, I don't want to say about uh, non-profit. I'm sure Madhu can say that. Uh, the, the talent part, uh, I think, uh, there are lots of people. I think Jeff is a great example. I mean, uh, he was a very successful consultant. And then he said, I want to help non-profits. So therefore, I will found Bridgespan, right? Clearly, I mean, while Bridgespan has been a great success, all of that, it's still not at the same level as, as Accenture. 
So there are lots of wonderful, well-intentioned people. Kailash is another extraordinary example. He was a successful electrical engineer who designed transformers, who was a professor, all of that. But he said, look, this is not what I want to do with So I think there are sufficient number of, uh, you know, well-intentioned human beings. The, the task is to <laughs> search for them and attract them. And what is the third other one? social enterprises. Basically what you mean is they are operating in a market which is where the disposable, disposable incomes are low, where the profitability is low, <coughs> which is very much needed at this stage uh, uh, of the context. Other than that, I don't know what's the difference I see. I cannot see much between profitable social enterprises and uh, profitable commercial companies. Okay, so so let's go to you, uh, Madhu Pandey. In non-profit sector in India, it may appear that professionals may not take part, and it's very difficult for professionals to take part. But America is a good example working in the non-profit sector. You can confirm that. Uh, in India, it's picking up, especially if you look at Akshay Patra. We have attracted a lot of professionals who are career-oriented. It's not that they earn anything less than what they'd have earned if they were working outside. The additional point for some well-intentioned people is the satisfaction that they are working for a social cause. At the same time, their career is also uh, taken care. So it's 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 something new in India. But uh, I think the factors that I said, if they earn, if there is a career for them, and the additional point of satisfaction in the job is also there. I think it would not be any difficult to attract the professionals, professional talents to come into the non-profits. So one thing, can I just add one thing to that, uh, to what Madhu Pandit says. I am a children, I am a child of two cultures. I have been in India for the first 30 years, 29 years of my life. I am now in the US. In the US I started doing a lot of commercial stuff, marketing, and then I switched my career in the last 10, 15 years in social enterprise. They say necessity is the mother of invention. Some of the best social enterprises in the world are to be found in this region. In fact, I would say India is ahead of US when it comes to social enterprises, especially social enterprises that drive surplus. Bangladesh is fantastic. Bangladesh, India, these are the countries that are throwing a lot of social enterprises where it's not the profit but making a surplus through earned revenues. The surplus cannot be redistributed. That's the whole idea of a trust or a non-profit. But some of the great organizations exist in this part of the world. So I won't write us off that easily, Madhu Pandit. So even though I live there, I think we have a lot to go by. Jeff, why don't you have the last word? Yeah, just two, I'll just pick up two of the themes. One is just the open source information, which I do think is a really important piece. But it gets to a, a, a puzzle that you posed earlier, Cash, which is that when people do provide information, um, in the for-profit sector, competitors would immediately take it, copy it, and attempt to kind of outcompete you. It's it's been striking, and all in, in all my examples would be in the U.S. right now. How little demand there is when, in fact, you put information out, mm -hmm. and so they're just the the pressure. A lot of people are reinventing things in different communities when you you kind of say, call the sandbox. You're doing this. My guess is that your odds of success will increase if you would pay attention to that. So there's a there's a puzzle about whether it's enough to simply put out case studies, to put information out, or it needs to be supported in some way to help people actually pick it up. The second thing is just to pick up the talent. 
question because I agree completely that one of the interesting things over the last decade, um, for sure in the United States, I see it in India, is just the, the amazing flow of talent, and it's reflected in this room, of people saying, I want to make a difference in the world um, and do it in a way that at the same time is satisfying, builds my skills, and develops me over the course of time. And so I, I think that that's one of the shifts has been the flow of what we often call bridgers, for-profit to non-profit, folks bridging the sectors, looking for opportunities, and very rarely, in my experience, has it had anything to do with compensation. If you, you can play with bonus systems, you can do that. That's, that's rarely, in my experience, what's important. There has to be fair pay typically nowhere near what it is in the for-profit sector. Um, you work at Bridgespan, you do not make the same amount of money for a nonprofit as you would if you worked at Bain or McKinsey. You just, the economics quite simply don't work that. And so that you, you make less, but the proposition of being able to work on things you care about make a difference in the world, and have some, the organization invest some in you so that you're actually getting training and skills. So at Akshapatra, there's training programs, there's people are not only giving, that's kind of their motivation for being there, but they're also developing themselves over the course of time uh, by being there, which is powerful. So, can I add something? One thing is, uh, <clears throat> some advocacy is required where the industry would also, uh, let's say I give an example. Suppose if the fresh MBA graduates that are coming out of the MBA colleges in this country. They say that, okay, for the development of this country, programs like Akshay are very fundamental to feed the population. Therefore, you know, they promote in conjunction with the industry. The industry would give some credit to anybody who spends one year in an organization like Akshay Patel. And five, 10,000 graduates are coming out every year. And if they you know, come and give their uh, talent for one year in a rural area, wherever it is, it will make so much difference. So in other words, the industry also, which, which uh, people look upon as a, a, an area for their career growth, if they give some credit to this, it make a lot of difference. Actually, uh, I think here is where I think in Indian industry, we don't have them represented here. Is my mic working or should I just shout like I have that gentleman to shout? So, so with, the, with the new CSR bill, where industry is required to spend 2% of after-tax profit on CSR activities, they say close to $4 billion, that is how much, 22,000 crore rupees, 22,000 crore rupees is likely to come into the sector. That's where I think your idea can make a lot of sense. Not just money coming in, that's the easiest thing for corporates to provide. If they provide management talent, that's what you're saying. Provide management talent, the food companies, the agribusiness companies, the operational companies. If they could send people, deputy people to come work there for a year, two years to put good use of the CSR money they are giving, not just in Akshay Patra, it might be in agricultural business, it might be in other kinds of business, education, etc. I think we can make a lot of progress where you can get the training and the talent, etc. But at least this is what I've heard. I'm going to close out the panel because I know we have a long evening, but at least what I've heard about scaling is we have to be flexible, we have to improvise, we have to take advantage of the opportunities exactly the way Akshay Patra has done. However, Narayan Murthy left us with the lesson that, but bring management principles. Think about efficiency, think about optimization. That's when scaling becomes meaningful, it's not wasteful. So how can we improvise, be flexible, yet at the same time have the management disciplines and rigor? When do you really call the shots in terms of I'm going to scale now, or I'm going to scale laterally? Tell, those are the questions which have still not been answered. But there are big, big issues we have. We are born to scale because we have 700 million people in India who are still lower middle class, 300 million people below the poverty line. We have a lot of work to do. Let's thank the panelists. Terrific. Let's move on to the next one.